Please be seated. Thank you. The Acting Executive Dean of the Faculty of Science, Professor Anna Moteta, Professor Peter Dunkelman, the Professor Gert Sabdusi, our respondent this evening, senior leaders of the university and fellow academics of the University of Johannesburg and PA institutions, special guests of uh, Professor Dunkelsman, in particular uh, your spouse and partner, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, Sunny Bonani, uh, Tobel, I, I, I don't hear myself, but okay. It's indeed a, a great and a very special honor for me to to rise up this evening and to extend to each one of you a special welcome to the professorial inaugural lecture of Professor Dunkelman here at the University of Johannesburg. And so, as I do so, I want to express a very warm welcome to his loved ones, his special guests, and his colleagues. This is so because this is a proud and a joyful moment for us here at the University of Johannesburg. And I'm certain uh, for Professor Dunkelman, and of course, uh, for family, friends, and colleagues. I often remark on these occasions that one of the most joyous and most important roles of the Vice-Chancellor is this one. I reflect on the fact that graduations are a very important part of the life of universities in Africa and beyond for that matter that in addition to graduations there are many other important functions such as the top student achievers awards the vice chancellor research teaching and learning and innovation awards functions they are add the long service awards functions the occasional that is the monthly tea that i host with members of staff in my office so a very intimate little function that I host in order just to get insight into the thinking of ordinary members of staff of the University of Johannesburg. I reflect on the quarterly conversations, quality conversations that I have with the executive deans. And of course, uh, there is a list of other important roles, I'm told, that vice chancellors have to perform such as chairing Senate meetings and Senate Executive Committee meetings, um, of reporting to council and council committees, and so on and so forth. But I still come to the conclusion that this is not only the most joyous, but also the most important role that a Vice-Chancellor can perform. And that is the role of inaugurating into the most senior community of scholars of the university. And of course beyond um, our most senior academics. And so this evening brings me certainly great joy um, and great pleasure. Now, inaugurations, many a time pompous. You see what I'm saying? sometimes decadent as well, but hopefully mostly dignified, well-meaning, and unsullied, we're told date back to ancient Greece as the opportunity for the formal investiture of a person into high office. And that that day marks the formal, the symbolic, shall I say, assumption of office or position of authority. And so today is that day that marks the rites of passage, at least from the point of view of the University of Johannesburg. The rites of passage and the entry of Professor Dunkelman into the distinguished community of university's most senior scholars. It is indeed an office and a position of authority and of leadership which we shall not assume lightly. 
but shall do so with considerable and ongoing thought, reflection, deliberation, and die, dare I add, presence of mind. So, the professorial inauguration is an, as important to the incumbent and their loved ones and colleagues as it is to the university. I say this since the inaugural lecture is as much a reflection on the state and the intent of the contemporary university and therefore how it measures up to Professor Dunkelman's inaugural lecture on graphs, Google in the six degrees. On these occasions, it's worth reflecting on the remarks of Vartan Gregorian in both his hopefulness and controversy when he announced to us that <coughs> universities are not only repositories of past human behavior, they are, in his words, instruments of civilization. He continues, they provide tools for learning, for understanding, and for progress. They are the wellsprings of action, a source of self-renewal, of intellectual growth and of hope. They are mediums of progress, of autonomy, of empowerment, of independence and self-determination. I'm sure you can see what I'm suggesting that, yes, hopefulness, but also controversy. If one just scans universities in their contemporary situatedness, um, in nations across the world. And yet at the same time it's worth reflecting on Wernick's argument that as he observes the university has a contradictory relationship with its surrounding society. On the one hand the autonomy in terms of the axial values of truth, of wisdom, of science and so on. And on the other side he continues those who control the means of material production control the means of mental production. And the dominant ideas are the ideas of those who dominate. I'm also reminded that very few books are available in decent bookstores on what it is to be a professor and in particular what the freedoms and duties of the university's most senior scholar is. In this regard, I offer you the reflections of Bruce McFarlane, a colleague at the University of Hong Kong in his book, Intellectual Leadership in Higher Education, Renewing the Role of the University Professor, seeks to correct this oversight and argues convincingly that the corporatization of the research agenda, that is in light of that, professors must reclaim professorial leadership and that they thus occupy a very special role. Specifically argues the two freedoms, that of critic and advocate, are essential for professors to execute what he describes as their four duties, those of being mentor, guardian of standards, enabler of networking and mobilizer of resources for others, and fourthly, ambassador for the institution or the discipline. So this evening we will have only one small insight into how Professor Dunkelman responds to this call for the return of professorial leadership. So let me now invite the acting executive dean of the Faculty of Science, Professor Anna Motete, to formally introduce to us Professor Dunkelman. I thank you. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Dunkelman's Book of Life from the academic perspective, reads as follows. He joined the University of Johannesburg in 2012. He was born and educated in Germany, where he received his PhD in mathematics from Aachen University. After completing his PhD, he joined the mathematics department of the University of Natal in Durban as a postdoctoral researcher for a year, after which he took up a permanent position in this department as a lecturer. 
Following promotions to senior lecturer and associate professor, he was promoted to the rank of professor in 2007. Peter Dankelmann is an active researcher in graph theory, a modern branch of mathematics that is concerned with the study of networks. So far, he has published over 75 research papers in peer-reviewed international journals, and he is currently completing a book on his research specialty, Distances in Graphs. He is a member of the editorial board of the international journal Utilites Mathematica and a founder member of the editorial board of the international journal Electronic Journal of Graph Theory and its Applications. In 2005, his then university, UKZN, nominated him for the National NSTF Science and Technology Award in category B for the best contribution of an in individual over the past five years. In 2007, Peter was elected a member of the South African Academy of Science. He currently holds an NRF B rating. Although his true passion is for research and teaching, he has also been involved in other aspects of university life. During his time at the University of Kwasi Natal, he served in numerous committees, most notably on Senate, the Senate Steering Committee, the University Research Committee, and the University Council. Outside the university, Peter has been actively involved in the promotion of science, especially mathematics. For nearly a decade, he was the national organizer of the South African Interprovincial Mathematics Olympiad, a mathematics competition between teams of learners from the different provinces. Since joining the University of Johannesburg, Peter has been instrumental in setting up South African Tertiary Mathematics Olympiad, a mathematics competition between universities, which took place in 2012 as an initiative of the University of Stellenbosch and the University of Johannesburg. Peter also has a passion for the game of chess. During his time in Durban, he twice won the title of KZN Chess Champion and he served the Durban Chess Club as president for over a decade. His greatest, greatest joy, however, is spending time with his wife, Hazel, and his and their son, Thomas. Thank you. Vice Chancellor, Acting Dean, dear colleagues, dear friends, it is an honor and a, a privilege to, to stand here before you and give this inaugural lecture. However, before I start, I would like to say a few words of thanks to the Mathematics Department and the Applied Mathematics Department, because when I joined this university, just over a year ago, I found colleagues who showed a true passion for mathematics, for teaching, for research, which, and a high professionalism that very quickly convinced me that I've come to a good place. In addition to that, they showed welcoming ways and a great humanity that certainly totally convinced me that I've come to the right place. Thank you for that. Now to the mathematical part. <laughs> this is a lecture on, on graph theory, but I want to start with a few more general comments first. Mathematicians have a little bit of a reputation of um, of doing research that's mightily interesting, very complicated, and very often high up in the sky without any relevance. However, that's not entirely true. Although many of us mathematicians are pure at heart, no pun intended here, <laughs> many of us are also applied at heart. Let's go back very quickly into the history of mathematics because most of it has actually been inspired by needs of the society of the day. Let's look at um, ancient cultures. 
for example, in ancient Egypt, the necessity to predict seasonal events required, required astronomy. The um, <coughs> architecture, the fact that people wanted to build houses, palaces, universities, required geometry. <laughs> navigation required navigation required geometry. If you wanted to go to far far away places, you needed to know where to go. And and so on. In the Middle Ages, increasing trade required algebra. For example, take take as a simple example the introduction of Roman numerals, which made manipulation of numbers a lot easier. Just imagine two Roman numerals, try to multiply them with long multiplication. It's, it's quite difficult. And with new developments like the introdu introduction of Arabic numerals, things got a lot simpler. Later in the 19th century, we had a few further developments. For example, problems in mechanics and physics inspired differential and integral calculus. Gambling, which has been a passion for hundreds of centuries, required the theory of probability and statistics. And um, later towards the 20th century, just to pick a few of the developments, <coughs> were um, industrial processes that were examined, investigated, and that had to be optimized. This inspired things like linear programming. Economic models had to be developed. Much of this uses game theory, another modern branch of mathematics. And then around the middle of the century, computers began to be developed, invented. And this, in, this necessitated a need for a theory of networks. And that's, hold on. That's, now where are we? That is graph theory. <coughs> graph theory is the theory of networks. Its history started, uh, well, a good almost 300 years back, 1736, with the Königsberg bridges, which were mentioned by my colleague Prof. Henning in his lecture. However, I won't use any of the contents of that lecture here today. Um, then, 200 years later, on the dot, the first book on graph theory, then it was in its infancy, appeared, and slowly it began to mature into a proper, um, quite substantial mathematical discipline. In particular, with extreme graph theory, very important, the um, probabilities, probabilistic graph theory, random graphs. And in the 1990s, a very interesting development started, which I want to tell you a little bit more about. It is the investigation of large real-world networks. We'll come to that in a moment. OK, I've spoken about graphs, but I haven't told you yet what they are. Well, I still won't do that. However, I will start by telling you what they are not. <laughs> because whenever I tell people that I do graph theory, they think, ah, yeah, I know that. There's x and y and x squared. Now, this is what you see here. That's not a graph. These things, yes, they are called graphs, but they just happen to share a name with what I do. The graphs that I'm interested in, the graphs that are the, the subject of graph theory, are, and I'm giving you just the informal definition. It consists of points in the plane called vertices. And some of them are joined by lines, which we call edges, <coughs> others not. Here's an example of a graph. Here are the vertices there, and there, there. Six vertices, and you find seven lines joining some of them, <coughs> the edges. That's a graph. Now, this, this may remember you of uh, drawing by numbers, so something that you wouldn't take too seriously. And um, really, maybe we left it as um, well, when we left uh, primary school, so why should we look at that again? But graphs are indeed omnipresent. You will find them all over in the real world. One example for a graph that you might have used very recently, a map. Here, a map of South Africa. The vertices, the dots, are just the cities. The lines, for example, the highways, 
or railways between them. That's a graph. Then you can ask interesting questions like, how do I get here from Durban to Cape Town? What's the best and shortest route? In this case, easy to answer, because you can just look at the map. But if you have a map not with 20 or 30 cities, but maybe with 20 or 30,000 cities, you need clever ways to do that. And that's one important branch of graph theory. Here are a few other examples of graphs. Tra any transportation system, or most transportation systems, are graphs. Here's a famous one, London Underground. The dots are the different stations. The lines are the direct connections between them. <coughs> Similarly, how train is, is a graph, but it's, at this point it looks a little bit more boring. That's why I thought London <laughs> Underground. Tell us. Yet another graph here. The, the structural formula of, of chemical compounds. This one here is butane. You see the graph in it right away, dots and lines. Some of these, well, these dots have names, C and H, but uh, it's a graph. <coughs> and much work has been done on that, trying to derive from the structure of this graph to derive the chemical properties of the compound. More networks for you, or more graphs. Social networks are the, the something everyone is talking about nowadays. Here, social networks, for example, with people being the vertices, the dots, and the lines if they are friends, or, as in this example, if they had communication. Here you see a phone call graph of the population of an island off the coast of Florida, and with phone calls between people over a 10-day period. So two people, two dots are joined if the people had a, made a phone call to each other over the past 10 days. Another impressive graph which you've probably used today, the World Wide Web. All the web pages, you can draw a dot for each one. If there's a link from one web page to the other, you draw a line, you get another graph. And that's a very important and one very well investigated and uh, still very interesting. Another one that was more in the negative headlines a couple of years ago, the banking network. Think of the subprime crisis. Everybody was talking that the banks are too much linked. The failure of one bank causes other banks to topple. So people began thinking about that. This is also a graph. Take all the banks or all the big economic players, and if there is some strong economic interaction, for example, between banks lending, lending of money, that's another graph. So I hope that convinced you that graphs are really around and relevant. One tiny little bit. In general, these lines between the points in this talk, until otherwise said, don't have a direction. So you, they, they connect things both ways. In some cases, I will take a few liberties on that, which graph theorists will easily spot. Forgive me for that. Let's talk about one aspect of graph distances. And that's something I do a lot of research in. Let's uh, very quickly define the distance between two vertices. <coughs> and I'm giving you the informal <coughs> definition, which is, however, can perfectly stand up to the formal definition. It tells you the same thing. It just sounds a little bit less elaborate. The distance between two vertices is just the number of hops, <coughs> if you hop along edges, that you need to get from the one to the other. So for example, the distance from A to F is 3, because you can get there in 1 from A to C to D to F in 3 hops. <coughs> you could also get in 4, but we count the best you can do, the shortest route that you take. Now, why should distances be so interesting? Well, distances are very relevant for, for real world graphs. So let's say depending on what our graph models, the distance from A to B can have different meanings. For example, in a transportation network, the distance from vertex A or from station A to station B is the number of stops that you need to take as you go from A to B. Let's take the, let's take the friendship graph. That's a graph in which the dots are people. They're joined by an edge, by a line, if they're friends. And there, the distance between two points, between two people, tells you how far apart they are socially. 
if two vertices, two people have distance one, that means they are friends. You can get in one hop from one to the other. If they have distance two, it means they have a common friend because you hop from A to the common friend to B. If they have distance three, well, they are not friends, they don't have a common friend, but a friend of A and a friend of B, some friend of A and B, are friends because you can go there in three hops and so on. So it tells you something interesting about about the relationship of these people. In the internet graph, that's <coughs> the one with the, or the World Wide Web, with the web pages. The distance from A to B tells you how many clicks you need to get from A to B. This is one point where I'm taking a little bit, little bit of a liberty with the direction, but um, <coughs> never mind. Or in the financial graph, the banking graph, if two banks are apart very far, then the failure of one bank is less likely to have much of an influence on the failure of the other bank. Of course, there are lots of other factors, but this is the first approximation, but we would know how to take other factors into account. With distances, one can also have a, like, quite a bit of fun, where, what mathematicians call fun, that is. And uh, one of these fun things is the Erdős number. Paul Erdős was one of the greatest mathematicians of the 20th century. He, well, he, he was a true mathematician. He lived for nothing else. He didn't have a home. All his belongings were in two suitcases. <coughs> and he would travel to visit people, to go to conferences, and uh, do research with them, very good research. The way it worked is that he wouldn't announce his coming. It might happen that at 12 o'clock one evening, the phone would ring. And Paul would say, I'm at the airport, pick me up. I'll be with you for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and then you work with him until you're really worked out. And then Paul Erdős would move on. And in, in the process of this life, he has um, produced an enormous number of papers, well over a thousand papers. And he had many collaborators. And that's the whole point of the Erdős number. The Erdős number tells you which distance you have in the collaboration graph that's the graph where the mathematicians are the vertices, and they are joined by an edge if they have a joint publication. <coughs> uh, the Erdős number tells you the distance to Paul Erdős in this graph. So if you're Paul Erdős, you have an Erdős number of zero. If you have written a paper with Paul Erdős, your Erdős number is one. If you haven't done that, but you have written a paper with somebody who has Erdős number one, then yours is two, and so on. <coughs> Well, this must have been a very good idea because of, uh, and possibly somebody saw something more entertaining in it because this idea was taken up by the Hollywood people who, who came up with a light-hearted variant of, uh, of the Erdős number, the Bacon number. Okay, if you've looked at this, <coughs> you've figured out that I'm not talking about what you had for breakfast, <laughs> but this is about your distance and the movie actor graph the distance between you and the actor Kevin Bacon, who surprisingly turned out to be the center of the, of the universe, of the Hollywood universe. And there it works exactly the same way. If you're Kevin Bacon, your Bacon number is zero. If you have appeared in a movie with Kevin Bacon, your Bacon number is one. If you haven't done that, but you have appeared in, in a movie with someone whose Bacon number is one, yours is two, and so on. And it is a pity, because I once appeared on TV, but unfortunately none of the people who appeared there were ever in a movie, so my Bacon number is infinite, I'm afraid. <laughs> however, however, there is another, there are some other surprisingly low Bacon numbers. Here, one is Elvis Presley, who has a Bacon number of two. Another one is uh, the recent honorary doctorate of UJ. Barack Obama <coughs> also has a Bacon number of two, who would have thought. Or for sports enthusiasts, the cricketer Tendulkar has, has a bacon number of three. Who would have thought that? And uh, just to tell you how popular this notion has become, Google has a feature that allows you to determine the bacon number of people, of actors. So you type in your favorite actor's name and say, and bacon number in Google, and it will give you exactly the sequence, the bacon number and which the movies are that link this person to Kevin Bacon. So this, um, this idea has become very popular. Okay, now let's 
let's go a little bit more into distances. So you have a fair idea of what it is. Now let's talk about uh, one important distance in the graph. That's the largest distance. <coughs> so between two vertices, if you try all pairs of vertices, and the largest of the distances between all of them, that's called the diameter of a graph. Here's a very simple example, the graph you've seen just now. The diameter of this graph here is 3. <coughs> because, for example, from A to F, the distance is 3. But check all other distances. There is none greater than 3. So 3 is the largest distance. We call that the diameter. Okay. Now let's use that a little bit to look at the things that I, that I mentioned in the title. But let's start with the six degrees of, of, of separation, which is, is a very, uh, which allow for a very interesting um, way of using graphs. For that, however, um, let me quickly quote the author Fred Hayes, who in a very interesting and readable <coughs> article in Scientific American uh, on graph theory, asked a simple question. He said, what's the diameter of the World Wide Web? And he immediately said, I do not mean, or don't tell me 12,000 something <coughs> kilometers, which would be the diameter of the Earth. What I have in mind is the diameter of the web graph. How many clicks do you need to get from one place to the other, at most, so that it works <coughs> guaranteed? And here, the current estimate is it's 19. Now you think. 19 steps is quite a lot. But if you think how many different pages the web has, I'm not quite up to date with the very latest estimate. But a couple of years ago, I found an estimate of 800 million vertices. Now, for a graph on, on 800 million vertices, this is small. The graph that I showed you a moment ago had eight, had, sorry, six vertices and a diameter of three. This one has 800 million and just a diameter of 19. So this is really small. Let's look a little bit at why this would be so. For that, I want to also to look at the six degrees, because that's, there, there is some um, similarity between these two. It, it has turned out that in the internet, in the uh, in other networks, in particular social networks, diameters tend to be surprisingly small, just like 19 for the whole of the internet. And so now the six degrees. That's a famous experiment by the sociologist Stanley Milgram in the 1960s. So it goes a, a while back. But it was uh, an experiment to find out how well are we socially connected. I mean, all of us with a whole world. And his experiment for the day it was absolutely ingenious. What he did is he enlisted somebody in Boston, the target, and then he got a whole lot of volunteers in, in Nebraska and in Kansas, which are, um, which are supposed to be real backwaters in the United States. Nobody here who studied there? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, then, not now, of course. OK, and um, so the idea was these volunteers would be given an envelope with the address of this target person in Boston. And they had to pass this envelope to another person who they thought to be closer to the target. The idea was that then the envelope would be passed on and passed on again, and then eventually reaches the target but would keep track of it and find out how many steps it takes. However, there was one important rule. You are allowed to hand the envelope, don't put it in the mail, hand it, and only to a person you know, not somebody you just happen to meet at the bus stop. It must be a person you know. The surprising outcome of this experiment was that most envelopes reached the target in six steps. That was, was really, really small. The conclusion that Milgram drew from this was that it <coughs> looks like about any two people on the planet are linked by six steps of acquaintances. So you can do the same thing between any two people on the planet. 
And this, these six steps eventually became the six degrees of separation, a phrase that became popular not immediately after this experiment, but only in the 90s because of a movie and a theater play. And yeah, they've become part of, co of, of general uh, knowledge almost. About this experiment, there was some criticism. It wasn't just accepted as it is because um, a few problems were there. Number one, that's something that mathematicians would raise immediately. Hey, I looked at your result. Six was the average, or to be precise, the mean, but not the maximum. So to say that everybody can do it in six steps, that's, that seems to be a little bit, bit uh, stronger than what you really found. Then they said, Kansas uh, may be quite uh, remote, but there are probably more remote places in the world. Well, I would suggest some places in China or some places in northern KZN. Where <laughs> so, and there were also envelopes, not a huge number, but not an insignificant number, who just disappeared. They never reached the target. So there was criticism, but after the, some discussion, it was generally accepted, yeah, there, there is some truth in that. OK, let's see what graph theory can do. So far, this was sociology. How can graph theory investigate here? And the graph that we want to look at is the acquaintance graph. And that's the graph in which we are the vertices, the population of the whole planet. And two vertices are joined if they know each other, if they are acquainted, acquainted with each other. If we take that graph, then this theory or the phrase of the six degrees can be rephrased as this acquaintance graph has diameter at most six. You can get from A to B in six steps, no matter who A and B are. OK, well, so far, so good. Graph theorists should be happy here. Yes, we have a graph. Now we can do something with it. But uh, it ain't that easy. Problem number one is. This graph isn't given explicitly. We don't really know, we don't have surveys to know exactly who is friends with whom or who has now recently decided they don't know this person anymore. So we don't know exactly the graph, problem one. Problem two, this graph is awfully big. You can't just look at it and then find out everything. There are a lot of vertices, too many to handle it easily. So what's the approach that you can take to investigate this graph? Well, you just take a small part of a graph What's, what surveys typically do, they look at the smaller sample, not the whole population. And you try to find properties. There's something that you can say about the graph. And then you extrapolate for the whole graph. Let's do that. And for that, we need a few more concepts. One is the degree of a vertex. That's just the number of other vertices it's joined to. Here, vertex A has degree 2, vertex D has degree 3 because it's joined to 3 to C, E, and F. And the degree, what does it mean for our acquaintance graph? It just means the number of acquaintances you've got. And a survey has shown in those days that people had about 1,000 acquaintances. OK, that depends on what you mean by exactly acquaintance. But OK, let's take that number. So in this graph, acquaintance graph, the acquaintance graph, you have Vertices have a degree on average of 1,000. We need another concept quickly. And that's the concept of a random graph. The random graph is something quite simple, although it seems hard to analyze. That's just a graph chosen at random from all graphs with the same number of vertices. So you take all graphs on 6 billion vertices, and you pick one on random at random. That's a random graph. Sometimes you say, I look at all graphs with 6 billion vertices with a certain property. So here in this case, for example, we would look at those in which vertex degrees have typically something like uh, vertex degrees are typically around 1,000. These random graphs were discovered by Erdrich and Renu, and uh, they are, I must say, awfully important. I didn't have enough enough uh, place here to write more than just important, but extremely awfully important uh, describes it better. And now the, 
one of the, the, the very remarkable findings of Erdős and Renyi and many other people who, who uh, worked on random graphs is that many properties of, of graphs, of random graphs and of all graphs, hold for either virtually all graphs or virtually none. So let's say 99% of all graphs or 1%. And the more vertices you have, the more pronounced this distinction gets. And with that, the reasoning is about as follows. The random graph, well, the acquaintance graph has about 6 billion vertices. Well, that was in the 1960s. 99% of all those vertices, of all those graphs with 6 billion vertices, have a dime uh, and uh, degree on average about 1,000. We look only at those. 99% of all those graphs have diameter at most 6. Therefore, in all likelihood, our acquaintance graph has diameter at most 6. We conclude, most likely, the acquaintance graph has diameter at most 6. Yeah. Here I did a little bit more serious mathematics. <coughs> but I want to skip that, otherwise uh, uh, it might get too late. Okay, so the theory of random graphs actually has investigated um, the diameter of, of a graph that you pick at random of 99% of all graphs in more detail. They have, it, these things actually have been quantified. And they found that if you have a graph on n vertices and the degrees of the vertices are on average about d, then the diameter of the graph is very likely very close to a constant, well, something that depends just on d, times log n. n was the number of vertices. OK. Now, this is the moment where, where there are many mathematicians around here, but where non-mathematicians tend to get a little bit worried. And <laughs> yeah, actually, I missed that at school. And <laughs> but, <laughs> the, but logarithms are not scary if you are allowed to cheat. OK, I'm allowed to cheat here. If we change basis not from e or 2, but we just change it to 10, then the logarithm is really essentially just the number of digits. OK, and that makes things easy. So that means we get a constant times the number of digits. And 6 billion doesn't have an awful lot of digits. So depending on what the constant is, the diameter is definitely going to be, even if n gets very large, if we have lots of people, very, very small. That explains why if you have a whole lot of people or more people for the same degrees, the, the diameter of this graph, of this acquaintance graph, won't be much bigger than that. It is really some little bit times the number of digits. Tiny number compared to the number of 6 billion. Well, this was the state of affairs a while ago until something happened. Around the 1990s and nowadays, communication has become much more observable. That's a big change. Why is that important here? It, it allows us to look at graphs like this telephone call graph much more easily. Nowadays, we have records, for example, about cell phone calls. You just take the records of everybody who makes cell phone calls, and you immediately get a very good picture of what's going on socially. These records are now more or less, I don't want to go into the controversy, available. Take the Facebook route. There people are friends, and it's, it's, it's fairly public. So out of a sudden, you can say a lot more about social structures. These graphs, you can see them. In the 1960s, you had envelopes, and you needed to be ingenious to find out what's happening. Now you just go to the internet. Okay, and there people found something that said these random graphs that I've used, well, they are good, but they are not quite a perfect model for, for large real world networks. They don't satisfy the power law. A few examples. I don't want to give you a per, um, formal definition right away. Let's take Lodkamp's law, which says, and um, yeah, the vice chancellor will find this particularly interesting because he promotes research at this university. If 
A of K is the number of authors who publish K papers, K scientific papers, over a certain period, then this is typically a constant times 1 over K square. So it's proportional or inverse proportional to the square of K. So for example, if we have at this university a thousand people who publish one paper, then we can expect to have 250 people who publish two, a thousand by nine, by three square, who publish um, three, and a thousand by 16, four square, who publish four papers, and so on. And we say that this A of K follows a power law with exponent two. Exponent two is this one here, constant times one over K squared. And typically when you draw the graph, the graphs look like this. You have a curve that falls, approaches zero somehow, but it, it, it goes on for quite a while. So you a lot publish one article, fewer publish two, even fewer publish three, and so on. The important thing that makes it a power law is this number decreases like the inverse of a polynomial. So that's the power law. This power law applies to, to many things. Uh, for example, to languages. Zipf's law, Zipf's law in 1952, he listed the English words in the number of occurrences. Word one is the most common one, word two the second most common one, word three the third most common one, and so on. And he found that the occurrence of word k is proportional to one over k. The remarkable thing is, this doesn't work just for English, it works for German, Zulu, whatever, for every human language that has been examined. And it even works for some programming languages. So it is a really um, a law that permeates well, basically all languages. City sizes follow po uh, power law. And graphs sometimes too. If the degrees of graphs follow power law, meaning that if the degree, the vertices of, the number of vertices of degree k is, are some constant times some polynomial of degree k, then we say this graph follows a power law. And they are, the graphs are called power law graphs. And power law graphs are about everywhere. Many, many real world <coughs> graphs turn out to be power law graphs. For example, the phone call graph there was one that was examined in 1999, a fairly big graph in the States, was a power law graph. A, a similar graph with emails turned out to be a power law graph, and so on, with movie actors and many other examples. The citation networks, even in biology, with proteins and their interactions, you also found power law graphs. So they, they are quite around. And here, yeah, the World Wide Web. One thing that's very interesting about many of these power law graphs is that the way they come about by something called preferential attachment. Meaning, if I come, if I move to Johannesburg, the people that become my acquaintances are more likely the bigger players, the people who know more, who are more active, and not the people who really don't know anyone. If I connect my website to the internet, then more likely I will have links to the bigger websites than to the, to the less important ones. And, these power, and this is absolutely consistent, this behavior preferential attach, attachment, with the way power law graphs are modeled. <coughs> I won't tell you how they exactly they are modeled, but they have been examined too, and it was found that, that they have a diameter of typically, if the average degree is d, of a constant times the log of the log of n. Log of log of n is an absolutely tiny number. If the log of n is small, then the log of the log of n is tiny. Take just for one example, the number 10 to the 100. Fairly big number, a 10 with 100 zeros in it. What's the log of the log of that? Well, the log of 10, let's look at the bracket first. You've learned that in, in high school. The log of 10 to the 100 where that has 101 digits, the 1 followed by 100 zeros. And the log of that is 3. So you start with a huge number, you get this. So that's why these uh, graphs 
tend to have a very, very small diameter, even smaller than expected. Okay, I mentioned one other application, and I will go over that fairly quickly. And that's uh, an application that is probably somewhat less academic, because most of you might have done that today, searching the web. This is one thing where you see graph theory in action every day without realizing it. The World Wide Web is a graph. In this case, however, it is what we call a directed graph. The edges have a direction, because a link from the University of Johannesburg to Google, for example, doesn't have to be both ways. Links go typically one way. So let's pay attention to that. Here's a tiny, tiny section of the World Wide Web. Google, the University of Johannesburg, our mathematics department, South African Mathematical Society, and me. Typically, when you have important pages, they tend to have one characteristic. They have large in degree, a large number of, uh, of other pages that point to them, that have links to them. And this number of pages that have links to a certain page is what we call the in degree. So for example, here, PD Home unfortunately has in degree zero. The South African Mathematical Society here in this case has in degree one because the mathematics department has one link to it. Um, so this is a graph, and that allows us to, well, to search the web very effectively. For that, uh, how do we search the web with search engines like Google? Okay, just very quickly, how do they work? Well, they have three parts. Part one is the crawler. The crawler here. That's a little thingy that all the time serves the web and collects information on the pages and sends it back to, to Google headquarters. Then at Google headquarters, you have an indexer. It receives all the information about every web page and picks out keywords. And the last part is the query engine. That's the one that comes alive when you type in a query. What it does is it looks at which pages have relevant content, then ranks it in order of importance, and spits them out important pages first. And the really difficult part is not the, the first part. Crawling the web is easy. Indexing everything is easy. The difficult part is how do you decide which pages are important? And Google seems to be doing that with, with an amazing accuracy. Typically, the, the website that you're looking for comes up first or second almost guaranteed on the first page. And here Google has a fantastic trick that old search engines, like some of us may remember Alta Vista and Lycus, Lycus, they look just at the text on the page and decided whether it's important. And that sometimes worked, often it didn't work well. Google is a lot cleverer. It uses the structure of the web. <coughs> and it tries to it tries to rank the pages according to importance. Now, hold on, where was I? Now, I just said important pages tend to have large in degree, lots of pages pointing to it. But you can't use just that if you want to find out which pages are important. You use what you would normally use in life. If you come to a new group and you want to find out who is important, then the best rule you can apply is the important people are those who know important people or let me refine that, who are known by important people. If Jacob Zuma and the whole cabinet and the vice chancellor and everyone else know you, then you are probably important. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's what, that's what the Google uh, uh, search engine does. It ranks the pages very cleverly. And it uses something that can be phrased in many different ways. Because I don't want to stretch your patience too much, I will just mention one way. That way is the rule that you say, if I assign an importance number to every page, what would it satisfy? Well, I would want to say that if many important people point to me as a web page, then I'm important. So. The rule is that my own importance should be proportional to the importance, to the sum of the importances of the pages that point towards me. Okay, and if I do that, just with this rule, I've given an, another way of doing that, but let's skip that. I find that 
this becomes just an interesting linear equation system that we can solve or that we can describe as a discrete, what is known as a discrete Markov chain. A certain equation system that we can solve <coughs> for which we find, and that will be the only hardcore mathematics I will mention, to which we can use the Perron Frobenius theorem to find the unique eigenvector of this matrix that has only positive entries, and that's the solution. So in other words, just applying this one rule, my own importance should be the sum of the importances, or proportional to that, of all the people pointing at me, I get a number that will describe my own importance. And that solves the whole problem. It may sound uh, surprising, but it works very well. And it does involve huge calculations. That's why some people call Google just the biggest linear equation ever seen. Because every second they solve equations with millions of variables. But it works very well, as you have seen. Well, I hope that I was able to convince you that graph theory has a lot of uses, that it, has, um, yeah, that it is very present in our lives, and that it is certainly worth studying and funding. <laughs> <laughs> With that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>
that there is perhaps a third option. And, uh, and I have decided, well, within the limits of time, that I will go that way. Namely, to talk, to say something about graph theory itself. Not of the particular practitioner of graph theory that we are, in a way, honoring today. <coughs> Um, because it is not at all similar, basically, to what Peter was, was telling us. <laughs> and um, there's also one thing that I would like to, uh, to point out to all of you, and perhaps one actually should point it out to most graph theorists these days. On one of his frames, <laughs> which was called 20th century, when he made this historical account, there was one line, and it was the next to last line before the punchline came. It was the line which said, computers, arrow, networks. And then underneath that, it said in capital letters, equals graph theory. Now, personally, uh, I take exception to that statement, and uh, this is one of the, the only needle. Uh, <laughs> because it simply is not true. Uh, graph theory is noticeably older than computers. And, well, unless in the Middle Ages you were talking about social networks, uh, it is also older than, or almost contemporary with some of the only real networks that ever appeared on the face of this earth, namely roads and railroads. Now the point is, graph theory did not arise from computer science problems. Never mind Euler and the Königsberg Bridges, I don't mean that. Graph theory came from honest to goodness, solid classical mathematics. It arose in algebra, to be precise in invariant theory, and particularly in topology. In fact, for more than 10 years, about from 1920 to about the mid-1930s, graph theory did, was not, it existed, but it wasn't called graph theory. It was called combinatorial topology of line complexes, which is a pretty long name, and it didn't catch on really, but it shows you what it was and where it came from. The catchword in this was topology. And it was considered topology to to an extent that one of the most famous topologists of his day, of that period, who didn't like graph theory, called it the slums of topology. <laughs> but observe, he, he recognized it was topology, and not networks and computers and all this jazz. They didn't exist. Yeah? Well, uh, so much in order to set the record straight about where this whole stuff comes from. I must say, this notion, uh, of course, calling things slums of something, and it was an Englishman who said that, by the way, uh, that was well known everywhere in the English-speaking world, and that's a big, pretty big world. But the feeling that was behind that statement existed elsewhere in Europe, in Germany and in France and in Scandinavia. Graph theory wasn't really up to the standards that one normally would impose on mathematical activity. And one of, the f of its so-called failings was, there is no really English word for this, was its Anschaulichkeit in German. 
you could really draw these things, well, not with 10,000 vertices, but the small ones. <laughs> and you can get your intuition by looking at these pictures, which would very often mislead you, but nevertheless, you could do it in principle. And that was considered somehow below the dignity of what a mathematician should do. And I remember when I wrote my thesis, my PhD thesis, in the early 1950s, it was about graph theory, but it had to be called officially a thesis in topology because you could not officially submit at the University of Vienna a thesis in graph theory. That was not an acceptable science. Topology was. And at the end of the 1960s, when I became appointed to the Université de Montréal, where I have been ever since, I was not hired as a graph theorist. I was hired as an algebraist, because it would not have been possible to sell a graph theorist to the powers that be. Which shows you, and you know, that's 1970. That's not all that long ago. And that spirit of graph theory is second class mathematics exists almost to the present day in quite a number of mathematics departments across this planet. Things have changed a little bit because graph theory has contributed very substantially to the solution of some fantastic problems in number theory and the distribution of the prime numbers. That is mathematics. And because graph theory did make certain proofs possible, it has now finally been accepted into the brotherhood of genuine mathematical disciplines. Well, I am aware that I have already badly overstepped my time, so I will let it go at that and thank you very much.